Thank you, everyone, for giving me the chance to be here. Um, so I'm going to be a little bit, uh, make things a little bit more complicated uh, for everyone because uh, I'd like to use some slides. And in order for you to be able to look at those slides, it would help a lot if we dim the lights a little bit. So if you're comfortable with this, it's going to get a bit more intimate as well. Hopefully, I won't be a problem. OK. Is, is this acceptable? Huh? Yeah. OK, great. So um, I'll start right away. I have 10 minutes, I'm told. Um, another warning is usually I give this talk in about an hour. So it's going to be a bit of a challenge for me. I expect you to be very strict. Oh, God, I've already lost a minute. OK, so let's see. So my talk is about, uh, I guess, to summarize how I see an escape from Earth to planet Mars. Um, the, way I, the way I interpret this is um, identifying what planet Mars is in planet Earth. So, in other words, my argument is that the, the sort of unlivable desert of Mars is something that is being developed within planet Earth. It's something that we're experiencing increasingly in terms of um, a, a, communities that are grown uh, to um, in growing uh, conditions of uh, individualization, in conditions of losing political agency, political subjectivity, a desert uh, subjects, political subjects, subjects that are being emptied of possibilities. So for me, the question is not about escaping Earth to go to Mars, but rather establishing a different relationship with our future on planet Earth. So, in order to do this, sorry, the, uh, is it too loud? Should I? Yeah? Uh, so, I argue that in order to do this, we need to look very closely at how imagination works. And by imagination, I mean how social imagination works. And that's very important. So, if we, what I describe as planet Mars on Earth is this, I see it happening uh, through a process whereby financial capital is colonizing our future. So again, if we, if we want to escape this process, we need to decolonize our future through enacting what I call radical imagination, social imagination. Um, this is, in terms of, I'm a sociologist, this is an idea that is grounded, uh, goes very far um, back to the writings of, um, I'll, I'll mention Benedict Anderson, for example, who talked about imagined communities, how the, fa how the ways in which we imagine the future is crucially important, not just because these are fantasies, what we dream of about the future, but because the way we imagine about the future has a huge influence and impact on how we actually live our present. It has a material impact. And in many ways, some of the inequalities of today's world are not the traditional inequalities between workers and capitalists, for example. They're not the traditional class inequalities as, uh, as we identified them years back. But they're the type of inequalities that are to do, I argue, with what access different social groups have to resources of imagination. And I claim that there is an unequal distribution of those resources of imagination in, in societies today, in Western societies in particular. So, from this perspective, social inequality and exclusion can be seen as being produced and reinforced through people's different kinds of imaginable futures. In that sense, Imagination and imagining the future is not a psychological process. It's not something that we do individually, each on, on our own. But it's, it's a social and collective endeavor. And I, I argue that what we are experiencing today are different kinds of struggles. As I said, not class struggles, but struggles between those groups that have the power to speculate. They use imagination in finance to speculate and make money, make profit out of speculation. And we have those groups that are being speculated upon, that, that they're experiencing this high anxiety of a future that is slipping away from their hands, precarious future. 
And these are the victims. So the new struggles are, I claim, be between speculators and the speculated upon, which is based on this unequal harnessing of imagination. So, oh, um, I have to use this, I suppose. Right, so, um, many of you will be familiar with uh, Yakov Chernikov and his architectural fantasies. Um, no, no way uh, claim to be an expert on Chernikov and his, his work, um, but part of the project that I'm working on with colleagues uh, at the New School for Social Research in New York, we call it the Radical Imagination Project, um, we, we use the, this image from his architect Chernikov's architectural fantasies because we think it captures this process of imagining a future, a fantasy, producing a fantasy that is not realized, his designs were never realized, these fantasies that were the predecessors for graphic design practices, etc., were never realized, but they anticipated nonetheless a future. They anticipated a future of the actually built, um, sorry, I need to remember to use this. So this is another one of his fantasies. So they anticipated an obvious future that came, came about much later on. Someone called Chernikov a down-to-earth fantasist. And I think this is a very interesting um, way to look at this productive role of imagination in anticipating radical futures. I'm going to try to be as brief as I can. So back to the question of Mars and escaping to Mars. Um, So I think that from a sociological perspective, if you like, from a perspective of how to construct, how to study different ways of relating to the future, we shouldn't be looking, as I said, for an escape, but what we should do is we should un unmask the hidden possibilities of the futures that are already here and and contained in the presence that we live on planet Earth. So establish, escaping to Mars should signify, as I said, reactivating those hidden futures, taking ownership of those hidden futures. And I'm, I'm showing this graph here because it's a very, um, very simple and very simplistic sociological graph of uh, representing how the, but the welfare of the median person on the planet Earth uh, historically evolves. So we can observe it in the past, it's going up. We can't really see it in the future, we can speculate about the future though. Um, it's in dotted line because it's hidden, we don't know it. So it's about, um, but what this means is that there are different ways, there are different futures. There's not one future, there are multiple futures. And this is a simple but such a key idea, the fact that there are competing ways to construct future. And so any social problem, inequality, global warming, refugee crisis, can be conceptualized according to those different competing ways of constructing our future. Um, Th this brings, this means something very simple as well, which means challenging the notion of Tina. There is no alternative. Um, I guess I don't have very much time. I wanted to talk a bit about how, what this means in terms of uh, uh, the looking at ways of imagining the future through using utopian practices and the utopian imagination. Um, but my main point about the role of financialization, and I, I can come to, my, to closing my talk with this, is that there's been a lot of debates about utopian practices and, and um, uh, organizing society in ways that are, are more sustainable, etc. But I think the danger in today's society is that the most powerful utopian practices are observed in the realm of finance and financial capitalism, in the remit of derivative products of high-frequency tra high trading, um, 
in utopias such as the Singapore airport, um, which I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with, but it's essentially um, a, 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 a block away from the, from the border police. It's, it's a, um, a purpose-built, highly securitized luxury warehouse within which the ultra-rich encrypt their art. Um, you can see, this looks like a Martian field, doesn't it? I don't know if you can see it. It is Mars on Earth, as I was saying. It's a dystopian place. But nonetheless, it's based on, an imagin on imagination, on imagining a specific dystopian future, which is here with us. So, uh, I guess my argument then is that we need the kind of, we need to recognize the utopias that are present, and the difference between utopias and dystopias here is who, as I said in the opening of my talk, who, what, who has access to those utopias? Dystopias are exclusionary worlds, the Singapore airport. Utopias are inclusion, inclusionary, they include pla places like public libraries, parks. There is of course all the, the work that my uh, other people in the panel will talk about uh, using harnessing technology, big data, green cities, artificial intelligence, the utopian imagination within those practices. But my, my concern and my hope at the same time is how we can enact the radical possibilities of those utopian practices to counteract financial capitalism's grip on our future. 